The Lewis Burke Frumkiss Center for Writing and Culture at Hunter College presents 10 Years of Best-Selling Authors and Great Thinkers. Each week we broadcast new videos from our 10-year speaker archive online for free at our website. We look forward to seeing you again when it's safe. Please enjoy this presentation from the archives of the Lewis Burke Frumkiss Center for Writing and Culture at Hunter College. The only one in New York who didn't know who Daniel Rose was other than an amiable guy I met at a social event and the husband of Joanna Rose, whom I did know, was interested in the arts. That was until Dan began sending me copies of his speeches that he thought I might enjoy, and enjoy them I did. Not only were they brilliant position papers across the whole spectrum of human endeavor, often relating to geopolitical matters and strategies, but also on the human condition. But they were, all, they were articulate in the extreme and logically presented as if Gary Kasparov had configured them. Later, through Dan, I actually met uh, Maurice Ashley, an Afro-American chess grandmaster from Harlem. Uh, but that's another story. Suffice that Dan is a master of rhetoric and the Ciceronian role. So I asked him if he would speak to us at Hunter, and he agreed. I didn't know that he was a dear friend of President Rob, who we are expecting here tonight, although she has not yet arrived. She has <coughs> leads a very busy schedule. Or that he was a mega real estate mogul, one of the most revered figures in the field. Or that he had been a military intelligence analyst and Russian language specialist for the United Nations, the United States Air Force, or a member of the Foreign Policy Association, the Council on Foreign Relations, the International Institute for Strategic Studies, or a frequent participant by telephone on forum, an English language political discussion TV program broadcast from Tehran, Iran. I did not know that Dan had been board chair of the Horace Mann School, my own alma mater, and closely affiliated with Yale University, his alma mater, which I might mention he told me tonight that uh, all his children, all his brothers, <laughs> the entire Rose family seems to have gone to Yale. Um, he's also associated with Harvard, MIT, Columbia, NYU, and the Israel Technion. I did not know that Dan founded the highly acclaimed Harlem Educated Educational Activities Fund, whose inner city students are flowing into the nation, nation's leading colleges and um, universities, and whose junior high school chess teams have ranked first in the nation. And uh, essentially, I did not know the myriad other awards and honors Dan has received for his good works, far too numerous to mention here this evening. As I said, all I knew was that Dan was a good guy, a mensch, and abundantly gifted as a thinker. Sometimes you don't see giants even when they are standing right in front of you. It gives me great pleasure, then, to introduce Dan Rose tonight as our 2012 Jack Burston Memorial Lecture. Um, Dan, and before he stands up, he's going to talk to you about something that is enormously impactful, and that is the art of uh, public speaking and how you can be good at it. And though some of you are, I suspect some of you could use a little uh, extra help. Dan? That's not to, that sort of thing shouldn't be mentioned generally. That's for your obituary. <laughs> this good man asked me to speak on public speaking, and his wish is my command. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to, not, I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil men do lives after them. The good, the good is often interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. What an opening, what a beginning. That's how Shakespeare begins 
one of the greatest speeches in history. That's his beginning, all right? And gentlemen, gentlemen, in England now a bed shall think themselves accursed that they were not here and hold their manhoods cheap while any speaks that fought with us on St. Crispin's day. That's how he ends another one of the great speeches in Western history. I know what, not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Another ending, great ending that's part of our national heritage. Friends, that's how great speeches are constructed. A strong beginning, a convincing middle, a rousing end, delivered with conviction by a speaker with authority, whose goal is to convince an audience open to persuasion. Now, at the moment, this seems like a lost art. The speeches at this year's Republican and Democratic National Conventions, with the exception of Bill Clinton's rousing speech and a few others, reflect what public speaking has become in America today. Angry polemic, gracelessly expressed, delivered to already converted partisans is standard fare. A nation that was moved by Abraham Lincoln at Gettysburg and by FDR's fireside chats, by John Kennedy's asking what we can do for our country, or by Lyndon Johnson's proclaiming we shall overcome expects and deserves better. Now, effective public speaking is not rocket science. 2,000 years ago, Aristotle observed that credibility, which he called ethos, logic, which he called logos, and emotion, which he called pathos, underlay all good speeches credibility, logic, and emotion. And that vivid images and appropriate use of figures of speech would reach the hearts and the minds of a targeted audience. Few of us will be called upon, like Winston Churchill, to revive the self-confidence of a frightened nation, uh, or like a Joan of Arc to encourage her compatriots while she was being burned at the stake. We may be father of the bride or a maid of honor, a eulogist at a funeral, uh, a commencement speaker or the recipient of an honor, and the basic rules are the same. Now, suiting the talk to the occasion would seem to be common sense. Cicero's phrase was decorum. Common sense, know your audience. The bawdy joke that a best man will get laughs for at a bachelor party will shock the people at the wedding. Uh, Mitt Romney's use of the 47% comment that went over well before an audience of true believers was a disaster when it was <laughs> broadcast to a larger audience. So decorum, Cicero's phrase, suiting, knowing your audience and suiting your discourse to the audience. Now, 
good delivery, something that Demosthenes called the first, second, and third requirements of an effective speech <laughs> has become rare in American life. Nine out of 10 of us mumble to people in the front row rather than projecting our voices to people in the back row. Many nervously speak much more quickly at a public speech to an audience than rather using the slower pace that all experts recommend. The best speakers, like Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton, use judicious pauses effectively for emphasis and for dramatic impact. And they raise their voice or they lower their voice as indicated for greater impact. Now, some techniques used by experts are dangerous for amateurs. Uh, in the Carter-Reagan presidential debate, for example, when Jimmy Carter passionately delivered his fiercest attack, Ronald Reagan chuckled. He threw back his head and he said, oh, Jimmy, there you go again. The audience laughed. <laughs> The lecture, the debate, and the election were over. It was just finished. An, uh, an amateur can't try that kind of technique. Now, debates, essays, and speeches are different art forms. The Mitt Romney, who bored his public at this recent convention acceptance speech energized them at the presidential debate, while with Obama, it was just the reverse. Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton excelled at both forms. They were great speakers. They were great debaters. Neither of them could write a decent essay. So these are different art forms. Now, when in the spring of 1963, our friend Bayard Rustin, a leading civil rights activist, invited my wife and me to have dinner with him and Martin Luther King Jr. We had recently just been deeply moved by reading his extraordinary letter from Birmingham jail, one of the most powerful missives ever written. Denied stationary in his prison cell, King poured out his thoughts on toilet paper, on the margins of newspapers that he was allowed to have, while Birmingham's police chief, Bull Connor, which I've always felt was a name <laughs> right out of restoration comedy, Bull Connor, turned fire hoses and vicious police dogs on, on uh, nonviolent protesters. King's letter was in reply, and if any of you have not read it, you should. King's letter was in reply to eight white clergyman who had written to tell, to tell him that his protest activities were unwise and should be held off. In prison, this letter from Birmingham jail had an evocation of St. Paul and Socrates, of Aquinas and Martin Buber, he cited Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego and their refusal to bow to the unjust laws of Nebuchadnezzar. 
his portrayal of the terror that black children felt throughout the South is a powerfully moving experience. It should be read in, by every school child. It should be read by part by civilized people everywhere as a reminder of what in our lifetime has been part of our world accepted and how far we've come for it. Sometimes we forget how far we've come in a number of things in terms of sexual preference, in terms of the role of women, in terms of blacks and so forth. And that's one of the things that we should remember. But in any case, here we were having dinner with Martin Luther King Jr. in the spring of 63. And when we gave our contribution, my wife and I, to help plan the Washington protest that he had planned for later that summer, I confess I hid my fear, my own personal fear, that bringing together vast numbers of civil rights activists with rednecked <laughs> southern policemen could set off a riot that would be counterproductive. I must confess that was my fear. This guy was just so fervent and so moving. It was formidably impressive. He was certain that the tone of the event would be spiritual. Who could have predicted that his I have a dream speech <laughs> that he was planning would be one of the nation's greatest orations ever? Now, I have a dream has been called the most important and influential speech of the 20th century America. Addressing a vast, transfixed audience, standing resolutely with his back to the Lincoln Memorial, King began his speech with, five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today, signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Again, what a man, what a setting, with Lincoln behind him, what an opening. You'll notice his opening five score years echoed <laughs> the four score and seven of Lincoln's. The King's speech, I have a dream, after evoking the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution as promissory notes, he declared that America had defaulted, that the check had come back marked insufficient funds. And he proclaimed, like Amos, echoing Amos in the Old Testament, that he would not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. He then went on to describe his dream, quote, deeply rooted in the American dream, he said. And then he went on to echo the resonance of the book of Isaiah. Once again, his ending, he finished citing, my country tis of thee, and he final conclusion, his final comment was to the old Negro spiritual refrain, free at last, free at last, thank God almighty, we are free at last. What an ending. The nation responded by supporting Lyndon Johnson's civil rights bill. Now, studying great speakers and great speeches can be useful, but studying failures or lost opportunities can be also even perhaps more helpful for mistake-prone amateurs. Studying great saves 
can be instructive too. Richard Nixon's emotional checkers speech, for example, effectively ended all talk of this embarrassing Nixon scandal fund. Some of you may remember there was a, a very real charge of misappropriation of funds. And here Richard Nixon got up and gave this emotional talk about this little puppy, after which there was no more talk about <laughs> this Nixon scandal fund. Mitt Romney recently, Mitt Romney's self-confident, crisp, authoritative manner in this first presidential debate, the eye contact, his eye contact with the audience, his gazes, his smiling gazes at his adversary did much in the view of the audience to overcome the weakness of his argument. Romney's argument in this debate was disgraceful. The facts, his presentation, his self-confidence, his eye contact was remarkable. That's what carried the day. Now, the failure of Obama's advisors and handlers to prepare him adequately for the first debate will be memorable and notable in political history. David Axelrod, his chief, Obama's chief advisor, noted after the debate, after the debate, Nick, uh, Obama's chief guru said, quote, this is a quote, the president showed up with the intent of answering questions and having a discussion. Romney showed up to deliver a performance, and he delivered a very good performance. Think of what this guy is saying. As Ronald Reagan's Peggy Noonan said years ago, quote, a speech is part theater and part political declaration, as if this should be news to a guy like Axelrod. When Axelrod was asked why Obama did not address Romney's, quote, 47% gaffe, he replied, this is, you're listening, it hasn't been fully discussed. This is going to be part of political history, I believe. This was Axelrod's reply. The president obviously didn't see the appropriate opportunity. What? The appropriate opportunity to make a point? Obama's opening, space, opening statement should have been, quote, Governor Romney is concerned about some of us. I am concerned about all Americans, including the 47%. That logically, rationally, should have been Obama's opening. There was no opening. How about his closing? Obama had no closing. What should his closing have been? Quote, we have started the recovery from the disaster we inherited. And with your support, we will finish it. That should have been Obama's final statement. We have started the recovery from the disaster we inherited. And with your help, with your support, we will finish it. And here, his guru, 
said he never had an opportunity. He didn't see the opportunity to mention the 47%. Now, this I have, must say, because there are some friends of my wife here who was very upset <laughs> at this because my wife thinks Barack Obama walks on water and she thinks Michelle Obama walks on water. Everybody praised Michelle Obama's talk at the convention. It was clear what the public came away feeling is this good woman loved her husband. Friends, that is the phrase, is necessary but not sufficient. Necessary but not sufficient. Had she asked me for advice, I would have added to her remarks, the man who shares my bed tries to look calm, but he spends sleepless nights over our casualties in Iraq and Afghanistan, and he agonizes over students who can't find jobs or unemployed workers whose insurance is running out. That's what Michelle Obama should have said. Not just that I am a sweet, warm, and loving wife and I adore my husband who's a nice guy. We'll elect such a person president of our Sunday school, not necessarily president of the United States, for a guy who has been charged with not feeling. That, I believe, was an omission. Now, Martin Luther King, Jr. wrote his own sermons and speeches. John F. Kennedy's were written by Ted Sorensen. Ronald Reagan's were by Peggy Noonan. Barack Obama's by John Favreau, young fellow who was considered brilliant. He is Obama's speechwriter. Franklin Roosevelt corrected his but the first drafts of Franklin D. Roosevelt's speeches were by skilled writers like Sam Rosenman, a judge, Robert Sherwood, Archibald McLeish, and others. These first-rate authors prepared the first drafts, which Roosevelt made tilted to his own voice. Now, if anybody here has to make a major speech. If you get help for a talk or you have someone prepare a draft, you are in good company. It's been done by the best. True, Martin Luther King <laughs> did his own. All the others relied on speechwriters. And once Ronald Reagan commented to Peggy Noonan, you know, I once wrote my own. <laughs> it's no disgrace to ask for help. And many people ask for help with the first draft and put their own stamp on it to make it theirs so it's their voice, not a speechwriter's voice. Now, writing your own material can not only be fun, but it also can be educational, and it's something that I advise strongly for a reason that may sound odd. <laughs> I love E.M. Foster's comment, how do I know what I think until I hear what I say? If you are forced to write your own speech, you will summon up thoughts, insights, locutions. You'll come away knowing more about the subject than you did before, and you will have enjoyed the exercise. 
So my suggestion is when you have, if you're father of the bride, if you're a best man, if you're maid of honor, if you have to have an award, <laughs> if you receive some presentation, if you're giving a eulogy at a funeral or whatever, there's nothing wrong with asking for help. But if you really take the time and effort, you may find it an educational experience as well as an enjoyable one. So my suggestion is allow yourself lots of time well in advance, plunge in and try writing your own. But number one, remember Aristotle's ethos, logos, and pathos. Ethos is credibility. You have to <laughs> speak with sincerity. You have to be seen as someone who's convincing and who's genuine. Number two, logos. You have to have a compelling logical argument. The rational uh, uh, position has to be well-based. And pathos is emotion. And you can excite emotion by figurative images, by here once again. My wife says, I shouldn't, she thinks I'm pro-Obama. I'm going to vote for him. I'm a contributor. But Romney spoke of individuals who were suffering. Obama didn't. If you want to make a point using illustrations, personalizing it, giving some kind of, of, of human contact to it, that's what the Greeks meant by pathos. Then you have to remember Cicero's comment on decorum. Remember who your audience is. Don't talk down. Don't talk up. Never apologize. <laughs> Never. <laughs> These are things that just don't work. Your goal is to establish a rapport with your audience, to make them feel comfortable with you and for you to develop credibility. And you want to deliver it. Deliver it speaking slowly, clearly with pauses. You want to speak to the last person in the room instead of mumbling to people in the front of the room, which is what one hears nine times out of ten. And most importantly of all, most important, all great speeches have something worth saying. <laughs> That's number one. When you have occasion to give a talk before anything else, I advise you most earnestly to think through what it is you want to say that's worth saying. To whom are you saying it? How can you express it most effectively to get the, across the point that you want to get across and to convince your audience of the message you want to convey. And if you do it yourself, my guess is you'll find it a lot more fun than you thought at the outset. Now, my question was, should I expand this to fill a larger share of time when as I told Lewis, my first draft of this talk said what I had to say. I didn't want to pad it more, but I thought we would leave the rest of the time for discussion. For discussion, let me just say quickly, here we are seeing one of the most important elections of our time. We are living in a dangerous time in which political discourse consists largely 
of fanatics on the extreme Tea Party right shrieking at fanatics on the Occupy Wall Street left, and there's virtually no discourse from the rational, moderate, civilized people in the middle. This is almost unheard of. The rational voices in the middle are silent. We're at a moment where everyone is speaking about the cliff, the fiscal cliff, the financial cliff. That's a sharp image, a cliff. And it's coming. And it's coming December 31st, which is right around the corner. And the American public, I don't know if any of you have seen in an aviary or a children's summer camp situation where you have a snake being fed a frog. The frog jumps around and the snake ends up just weaving back and forth and the frog becomes paralyzed with fear and the snake just eats the frog. Our public is virtually paralyzed now. Everybody concedes, that's right, the cliff, the fiscal cliff with all kinds of bad things coming. And you have on the right, no one on the right is discussing any increase in income. No one on the left is discussing no diminution of expenditures, yet everybody knows we must limit our expenditures, we, we must limit the gap between income and outgo. We cannot indefinitely continue with this imbalance, and there's no rational discussion. Once again, I believe that historians will be very hard, not so much on Obama, but on his advisors, because he appointed a commission to study the problem, the Simpson-Bowles Commission. They came up with the basis of discussion. I believe Obama's failure to push it to say, let's at least talk, let's bargain, let's negotiate, let's see what we can do. Obama's failure to push the Congress to embarrass them, to attack them unless they came up with, that's what other people, what leadership is. And I believe that our failure to address the Simpson Bowles concept of let's rational people get together and decide what we have to do is going to bring dire results. So we're living in a day and age where there is virtually no discussion, no give and take among moderate people. We, we are enslaved by the flacos of the left and the flacos of the right. And we, the members of the general public, are going to be paying for this. So I encourage you all to write, to speak, to be heard. And when you do, let me suggest that you keep in mind ethos, <laughs> logos, pathos, delivery, or Cicero called it decorum, and above all, having something worthwhile and important to say. Thank you. Brilliant. Let me just stay here, Dan. And I'll... Okay. I hope you enjoyed what I consider a brilliant speech. I thought ethos, pathos, and logos were the three musketeers, but you know, <laughs> at Hunter we don't <laughs> learn all history. In any event, I also think Obama would do well to drop Axelrod and hire Dan before tomorrow night. Nevertheless, Dan has been kind enough to ask you to join in discussion, have any questions you would like, and this young lady, Karen Zaylor, take the mic and just direct it to Dan.
Dan, that was a brilliant talk. I think his daughter, Emily, who was one of my closest friends, is just as brilliant as you are. I love her so much. My question is to you. Romney appeals to um, moderate uh, Democrats and Republicans, but by appointing Ryan as his vice president, he's taken a certain bent ideologically. And I, I wondered if you felt he could have appointed someone more appropriate where he could have perhaps uh, appealed to anti-Obama fans in a more profound way? Well, I think we're in a heartbreaking situation. I had at my dinner table, my wife and I had our dinner table this past week, a dinner party of various people, Paul Volcker, Vartan Gregorian. It was a, 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 a lively, stimulating group, and one of the couples there was the former governor of Massachusetts, Bill Weld, a Republican and Romney's predecessor. And this is not for attribution. I don't want to get into a fight with him. The essence of what his closest friend, good friend and ardent supporter had to say was, in effect, not literally, but in effect, don't believe a word out of his mouth. Mitt Romney is a rational, thoughtful, moderate, well-balanced fellow. Everything he has said since the beginning of this presidential campaign has been aimed at placating the Flaco Tea Party types whose support he needs to get the nomination and <laughs> with whom he is saddled. I was horrified that someone should say, a rational person should say, vote for a presidential candidate because you shouldn't believe a single word out of his mouth. <laughs> when he gets in, he is going to act very calmly. That's what's heartbreaking. These people are, this, the country has become so polarized that someone like Obama who really, I believe, is a moderate man, is being pulled by leftist flakes. There's no question that Romney is catering to the Flaco Tea Party types. Think of what, what the Grover Norquist mindset is. You have hundreds or dozens, not hundreds, you have dozens of representatives in the Congress who've sworn to vote for no increase in any tax for any purpose at any time, any reason. How can you run a government where these people are pledged, they're sworn to have no increase in any taxes? You have people on the left who are opposed to any increase in the ages of Social Security, in the ages <laughs> of any benefits. We cannot, we must, with an aging population living longer, we must have increased age, increased retirement. We can't afford to have people starting a work at age 25, retiring at 65, and you're going to have, and live to 110. But you have no di discourse. That's what I think is our heartbreaking situation. And that's why there's a poignant need for rational discourse and for the moderates to be heard. Yes, no, Norman? Uh, hold on, you, hold on. There's a mic coming so everybody can hear. I can reach the back. I know. Uh, I'm going to compliment you on a very fine, thought-provoking uh, talk. And I want to share with you uh, four observations that have come to mind as a result of what you said here Speaking tonight, to the mic. of what you're saying here tonight. Um, one, you can't always judge a great speech at the time it's given. 
Edward Everett, uh, who spoke at Gettysburg, spoke several hours. He was considered the feature speaker. His talk was the uh, considered the great talk. Uh, Lincoln spoke for a few minutes. Uh, we know that the, the Gettysburg Address uh, is eternal in our history. Uh, secondly, um, it was interesting to me the night before, uh, the, 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 the uh, right before the uh, debate, uh, I was with a group of people. And they anticipated uh, that Romney would win the debate uh, because the press uh, was going to declare him a winner to close the race and make it uh, more exciting for the public. Um, thirdly, with respect to great speeches, uh, out of my experience as a trial lawyer, uh, giving opening and closing statements, um, I found that writing out a talk never really helps. Outlining your thoughts and then speaking to your audience as you would in a one-to-one -one conversation uh, is the best way to express yourself. And then lastly, I'd like to share uh, this quotation with you. The whole purpose of a democracy is that we may take counsel with one another so as not to depend upon the judgment of any one man, but upon the common counsel of all. Woodrow Wilson in The New Freedom. Right. Excellent points. Let me reply to them one at a time. Uh, one, Edward Everett uh, wrote, Lincoln, when they went home, you in your two-minute talk came closer to the heart of the substance of the matter than I did in my two-hour talk. That's what Edward Everett wrote to Abraham Lincoln. Uh, it's funny, Lincoln said, the world will little note nor long remember. It's Everett that they little noted nor long remembered <laughs> uh, about the question of uh, a democracy. The, the authors, the James Madison and the others auth who authored the Federalist essays deliberately wanted give and take. They never interpreted. They never believed that you'd have stagnation they never believed. Nowhere in the Federalist essays is there a hint that you wouldn't have approval of Supreme Court judges. Nowhere did they feel that you have dozens and dozens of federal appointees, governmental appointees, held up because no one will approve them as a form of, of, uh, of, of uh, unfair pressure on no one thought these things. I have to tell you, I am, you now have, uh, our Supreme Court has passed a, a, given an interpretation in a court called Citizens United that equates dollars with speech. Dollars and free speech are equated. Their, their Citizens United equates the legal fiction of a corporation with a flesh and blood citizen. This appears nowhere in the American Constitution. It's judge-made law based on interpretation. I think the time has come. I think Citizens United is the worst decision since the Dred Scott decision, which ruled that people are property. I believe the time has come for a, for a constitutional amendment saying in English, dollars are one thing, free speech is another and that a corporation is a legal fiction, whereas a flesh and blood human being has other rights. That would go a long way to clarify 
what has become a nightmarish situation. What all the talk in the press is today about whether the Koch brothers giving their millions of dollars or George Soros is going to influence the election, and everybody knows it's not going to have much impact. What they don't know is that the Koch brothers are going throughout the country, entering the primaries and supporting Neanderthal extreme right-wing judges. The Koch brothers are using their money in a, in a judicial race where you elect judges. They are uh, trying to elect Neanderthal types where the, where the court decisions are, this is going to be distorting in every way. Money has become a vastly distorting uh, uh, fact in American life. In another talk I gave a while ago, I made the suggestion, I don't know how many of you follow racing car activities, NASCAR, the National Association of Racing Car Drivers have the practice across the shoulders of the racing car driver is the name of their sponsor. I believe another constitutional <laughs> amendment Daniel Rose would like, that every senator and congressman should carry on his shoulders the names of his largest contributors. I think that would be a very salutary event. That's a Daniel Rose original. So uh, we're going to take two more. All right, sorry. Guys. No, no. This is wonderful, but we'll take two more. The lady on the left, and then the gentleman in front of her. I'm torn between two questions because one is. Well, okay, I'll just throw the comment in. One is uh, Doris Corns Goodwin on Charlie Rose sometime last year, said that in Washington, the politicians used to socialize with each other. They used to play poker, they used to go for drinks or coffee or whatever, and that, that has ceased in, I don't know what time frame, but sometime in the past 25 years or 10 years or something like this, and that has made a big difference and trickled down somehow and out and is a sign of you know the 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 polarized climate we're in. I don't know if it, it, if it has influenced that, but it seems that it's a part of it. My question, though, is actually about this building off to the left, the Chrysler building. Um, as somebody who is so much a part of New York City and who does, have, uh, who does occupy such a role in the real estate field, do you have anything to say about this front page story the Times ran recently about the mayor's, Mayor Bloomberg's desire to, to see Midtown buildings fill up and change and, and somehow possibly what that might do for the Chrysler building. Or do you have an opinion or, or thoughts of your own about the Chrysler building that you might share with us? Well, this is a very complex subject briefly we are heading into an era of high density related to mass transit. I believe that when the decades ahead, for example, the suburban sprawl that took place after World War II with Levittown houses, with suburban, with highways, with the GI Bill for housing and so forth, uh, I, as well as education, I believe that in the future you're going to see uh, le more emphasis, I think in, let's say, Mount Vernon and Yonkers and so forth, Scarsdale, you're going to see high-rise apartments built on the railroad station with some shopping and some retail and some cultural and some entertainment and some restaurants, and they're going to take the train right into New York. I believe you're seeing higher density. And there are arguments that high density walk to work is coming. You're going to have a number of modules 
but transportation, because cities are strangling. And I think that transport mass transit, high density relationships are going to be the model of the future. They're energy saving, they're more efficient, they're cheaper, they let uh, they make more efficient use of, of, uh, how, of uh, transportation. There also is a theory by a number of, of uh, city planners that high density situations are more creative, more stimulating, more intellectually thriving, that you can, that the denser a city population is, the more vital and creative, the more entrepreneurial, the more innovative it is. And, and uh, I believe that, that, forget one building or one area, I believe what you're going to be seeing throughout the world is less automobile traffic, less use of highways. You're going to see more mass transit. You're going to see higher density, more ecologically sound buildings, and you're going to see higher densities in cities. Thank you. Last question, unless the president has a question. This gentleman over here. Uh, I very much enjoyed your talk this evening, Dan. Thank you for being here and sharing with us. Um, a comment and a question. Uh, I recently had the opportunity to have a conversation with Grover Norquist, whose name you mentioned earlier this evening. And I said to him, is there any circumstance at all where this nation perhaps would be totally on the brink of fiscal ruin that you could see releasing the people that have signed your pledge from their pledge relative to increasing the taxes in this country. And he simply said, absolutely not. He said the taxes were like barnacles on a ship, and once they attach themselves, they never go away. And my rejoinder was, well, perhaps this nation will go away. And he just shrugged his shoulders. Let me reply, this is a heartbreaking situation. Daniel Rose, if I were king, there is a tax called a value-added tax that's, a, in effect, a tax on consumption that's applied in every other major developed country in the world. We are the only country, developed country in the world, without a value-added tax. Number one, the value-added tax cuts consumption so that even if a family on welfare wants to spend money on Adidas sneakers, bang, they pay a tax on the Adidas sneakers. You can exempt food, you can exempt, you know, clothing below a certain amount. When I plead for people speaking out on the rational center, this country has three separate and distinct, although related, economic problems. You have a short-term economic problem, which is reviving the economy. That requires Keynesian stimulus. You have an intermediate-term problem, five to seven years or whatever, three, five, what, where you're bringing your your numbers into closer alignment. Then you have a long-term problem where the society has to live within its means. That's a long-term Frederick Hayek solution. You can't go on living forever with deficits below, above a certain percentage, moderate percentage of your GNP. But we have a short-term problem, and Paul Krugman is right. Uh, the Joseph Stieglitz is right. The Ra Larry Summers is right. The rational people understand you need to some temporary stimulus to increase local purchasing power to keep cities and towns and villages from destroying their, their teaching, their school systems, uh, ending all investment and so forth. We need the stimulus, and 
Obama, I don't know why he didn't mention that he kept the automobile industry alive. I don't know why his inept supporters haven't mentioned that. But A, you need a stimulus short term. B, it must be short term. As soon as employment improves, as soon as say, the, the society becomes somewhat deleveraged, we pay off these crazy debts. As soon as there are signs of life, you gradually have to cut your expenditures and gradually increase your income. On a long-term basis, no society can live without uh, at this kind of crazy level <coughs> of imbalance. So Grover Norquist is right, in a sense, in the long term. He is demonstrably wrong in the short term. The short term extreme left people have to face the fact that we cannot afford indefinitely carrying the kind of benefits and entitlements that we are now giving our public. One last point. The American public needs, it's crying out to someone, draw a distinction between expenditures for consumption and expenditures for investment. Dollars you spend on education, on scientific research, on education. Education, uh, in, in infrastructure, and scientific research are expenditures for the future. They are investment. We need to invest in the future. Our society has become present-minded. No one in our society thinks long-term. One last thing, I prom my wife made me promise I would not mention our Harlem activities. Let me just say, we deal with Harlem children, public school children from central Harlem with after-school programs. Number one. 100% of our children graduate from high school. Number two, 98% of our central Harlem public school children go to four-year colleges. Number three, 95% of them graduate from four-year colleges, and one-third of our Harlem public school children go on to law school, medical school, engineering, graduate school, and so forth. Most interestingly, with well over a thousand kids, over half of whom are women, we've had two girls become pregnant. 72% of all black babies born in the United States last year were to unmarried mothers. That's a disaster. Aside and apart from anything else, that means no, that means one income. An unmarried mother doesn't have the income of the father to help support the child. So it's a disaster if Dayenu, if only for that <laughs> for that reason. But we don't give out condoms, we don't give out birth control information. We give these children a sense of the future. Our little girls don't become pregnant because they don't want to become pregnant. They have a sense of the future. They have the self-confidence to know what they can accomplish. They know where they want to go. They know and understand the time and effort and commitment it takes, and that's their secret. Our whole society has to become more future-minded. No one is talking about, no one is telling Grover Norquist, we have to distinguish expenditures for consumption versus investment. Last word, money spent on education, on infrastructure, on scientific research is like our seed corn. 
A farmer can't eat up his seed corn. That's the future. So if you come away with no other thought from today, our society must become future-minded and rational people like us in the middle have to shout it from the rooftops. Great, Dan. By way of appreciation, all those who would like to see someone of Dan's caliber in the White House, applaud. <laughs> Thank you. That was just wonderful. wonderful. Now please join us for whatever food is left. And if you would like to say hello to Dan, he'll, he'll come in the back and sit somewhere and you can say hello.